Good afternoon and welcome to our very first edition of our new Beacon discussion series. Today we will start with remarks from our new chancellor, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, and then we will hear from our incredibly talented and expert panelists as they discuss the intricacies of climate change in Boston. At this time, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Chancellor Suarez Orozco. He started his tenure here at UMass Boston back in August 2020 and immediately got to work, quickly identifying our institution's strengths and creating a plan to bring UMass Boston to the next level. We all are incredibly grateful to have a permanent chancellor and we're excited about the future of our beautiful Harbor campus. So without further ado, Chancellor Suarez Orozco. Good afternoon, fellow Beacons. My name is Marcelo Suarez Orozco and I have the honor of serving as your chancellor. I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and well. For nearly a year now, we have been living in the shadow of a global pandemic. Since last March, the University of Massachusetts Boston has operated in a primarily remote manner, and much of our operations remain remote today. This pandemic has challenged us to provide a safe and engaging learning experience for our campus community, and we have risen to that challenge together. You know that now and moving forward, we will continue to prioritize safety and wellness of our faculty, staff, and of course, our students in achieving their hopes and dreams to pursue their college degrees. We're actively reviewing public health data and are in constant contact with public health officials. I am hopeful that we can now look forward to a time in the not too distant future when we can once again interact face to face here on campus. As we continue to navigate these challenging times, I am proud to say that we continue to excel and to exceed our enrollment goals. This is no doubt a credit to the flexibility and creativity of our extraordinary faculty as they adapt to this new style of teaching and our staff who are working tirelessly to maintain continuity of operations. But I am most amazed by our students. Despite the many obstacles they encounter, they manage to remain deeply engaged in both their studies and extracurricular activities. In the midst of a global pandemic, our research and activism have come ever more important. At UMass Boston, we're facing the challenges of our times, from systemic racism to the training of the next generation of health professionals to climate change and climate resilience. I am very excited that our Office of Alumni Engagement and School for the Environment have put together this wonderful program for you all to enjoy. We're entering an era of dangerous climate change and climate extremes will move into our living rooms instead of happening thousands of miles away and to other folk. With unchecked climate change, we put ourselves and all our most vulnerable communities at risk of new and re-emerging infectious diseases, rising sea levels, along with heat extremes, droughts, megastorms and floods. We need to take up the cause armed with the best of science and logic to disrupt the malignant effects of unchecked climate change now and moving forward. Today, you will hear from two of our expert faculty members, Ellen Douglas and Paul Kirshen from the UMass Boston School for the Environment, as well as two of our very own outstanding alumni who are working to mitigate issues in the city of Boston and our surrounding areas. I hope you will enjoy the discussion and I encourage you all to participate in the question and answer session at the end. Be well and go beacons. <laughs> 
Thank you, Chancellor. At this time, I'd like to introduce our outstanding panelists. Dr. Ellen Douglas is the Associate Dean and Professor of Hydrology for the School for the Environment. Dr. Paul Kirshen is Professor of Climate Adaptation for the School for the Environment. Carl Spector is a UMass Boston alumnus, having received his Master's in Environmental Science in 2005, and is currently the Commissioner of the Environment Department for the City of Boston. And lastly, Lucy Lockwood. Lucy is a UMass Boston alumnus, having received her Master's in Marine Science and Technology just last year, and is currently a PhD candidate here at UMass Boston. Welcome, and thank you all for joining us today. Okay, Paul, you're up. Okay. Well, um, uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon uh, for the first uh, Beacon Discussion Series. Um, these are the topics we're gonna to cover. I'm gonna briefly discuss some of the climate changes we're gonna be seeing in Boston. Then my good friend and colleague, Alan, is gonna be talking about how climate change might impact the central artery tunnel system. And then, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we call nature-based solutions to manage present and increased coastal flooding. Then Lucy, who's a graduate student in SFE, we're talking about what I'm calling green seawalls. Then finally, Carl, who works for the city of Boston, is gonna be talking about their management plans for dealing with uh, this incredible threat, crisis of climate change. So I'm just gonna jump in. First of all, um, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, that climate change is caused by the so-called greenhouse effect, essentially the buildup of carbon-based gases and other kinds of gas in the atmosphere from human activities are resulting in um, less energy being reflected back into space from the energy that comes in from the sun would result in warming up of the atmosphere. And so um, the atmosphere has actually warmed up about uh, two degrees Celsius since the uh, pre-industrial era and uh, they're shown in this slide here. And um, you know, many scientists think if it goes, it's already gone up two degrees Fahrenheit. If it went up another uh, degree or so, or two degrees Fahrenheit, we would have uh, major social, economic, and environmental crises. So it's very important we get a handle on climate change management now. And of course, the increase in global temperature is not the only uh, indication we have of, 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 of the climate crisis. For example, stubble has gone up maybe uh, six inches or eight inches globally to, uh, in the last 100 years or so. This is because the heat has resulted, resulted in the warming of the oceans and its thermal expansion, and also the melting of ice on land. And these processes continue today. So there are many indicators of the fact that we have anthropogenically changed our climate. We must deal with these climate changes. So, uh, I'm going to talk about what, what are the climate change threats we might be seeing in, in Boston. Um, and I'm going to start off right now with talking about the number of, a number of days that will be over 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, now and in the future. So right now we have about um, 11 days a year with the maximum temperatures greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see in this graph here, you see a, this graph is interesting for several reasons. First of all, on the x-axis you see time, right? essentially the present up to 2070, and the vertical axis you see days have been above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see in 2030, um, we might have 20 to 40 days when the temperatures are above uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is a range. Why is there a range? Well, one is, one reason, the primary reason is, this is if we have low greenhouse gas emissions between now and, 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 and uh, the end of the century. If we, have, and if we have high greenhouse gas emission scenarios, this would be the change. Notice also at the end of the century, the range gets larger. So right now we're sort of locked into this much climate change. But it's at the end of the century, the actions we take now to control our greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, there's a large impact in the future climate that um, you know, my grandchildren and your grandchildren are gonna have to live with. So if we have low greenhouse gas emissions um, by 2030, we only have 20 days a year that are greater than um, uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. High emission, we may have 40 days a year where um, greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. End of the century, if we stay in the path we're on right now, 
you may have nine days a year where the maximum temperature is greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Essentially, every day of the summer would be greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit max. Right now, we have about 11. So a dramatic change in our climate. Um, and this is shows so those changes in extreme rainfall. So again, a low emission scenario. Right now, extreme rainfall might be a little over five inches. End of the century, low emission scenario might be six. High emission scenario might be 6.5. I want to point out in the 1960s, this value is about four inches. So again, dramatic change in our climate because of anthropogenic emissions of these greenhouse gases. And then sea level rise. So again, notice the shape of the curve. We're sort of locked into, you know, roughly a foot by middle of the century, no matter what we do. But end of the century, low emission scenario, could we have 2.4 feet of sea level rise. End of the uh, high emission scenario, we could have seven feet or even, or even 10 feet. So again, this really emphasizes the importance of controlling our greenhouse gas emissions. If we can get them to zero by 2050, we're gonna face a future like this. If we keep on the path we're gonna go, we're on right now, could be seven or 10. Managing two feet of silver rise at the end of the century is a lot easier than managing seven. And Ellen's been talking about some of the consequences of this. Um, and this just shows, uh, you know, some of the flooding we've seen already in Boston. And um, I just want to end by showing uh, this slide here. This shows the extent of the so-called 100-year flood we might see in the 2030s and 2050s, depending <laughs> upon our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this 1% flood is, is a fairly rare event. Notice this area here looks very similar to this area here. But this shows the extent of flooding we would get monthly just from high tide by 2070s or later. So essentially an event that happens very rarely in a couple of decades from now, by end of the century could occur like once a month. And the other thing to notice is that this just shows the locations of various um, segments of socially vulnerable populations. So for example, this is like children, people of color, low income and so on. These areas, are very similar to these flood areas. So there's this whole issue of social justice. The people that have the least ability to deal with the climate change are gonna be impacted the less, are gonna be impacted the most. Um, so uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen, who's gonna be talking about um, flood management in Boston. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Um... So I'm going to be looking looking a little more detail at sea level rise, coastal storms, and, and the impacts on uh, us here in Boston. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Paul and I have been mapping uh, flooding due to sea level rise for quite a while, starting with back in 2007 when the Union of Concerned Scientists um, asked us to do that. So these show a couple of, of maps that we presented um, over a decade ago. Um, and before we go any further, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the factors that cause sea level rise. So we know, there are a number of factors. Uh, as Paul mentioned already, uh, as the ocean, as the atmosphere warms, it also warms the ocean. And as uh, water warms, it expands. So thermal expansion is one of the factors. Also, higher atmospheric temperatures causes glaciers and, and land-based ice to melt. And amazingly, uh, for irrigation, we're pulling enough water out of the ground and it eventually makes its way back into the ocean that it, it causes measurable sea level rise. And also, uh, we have ice sheets on Ar Antarctica and Greenland that are causing, that are melting and causing sea level rise. So in the 20th century, thermal expansion was the major factor that, that was causing the sea level rise uh, that we observed. In the 21st century, we're still going to have thermal expansion uh, effects. We're still going to have some glaciers left that are going to melt. But the predominant uh, factors that are going to affect our, that are affecting our sea level rise and will continue to in the 21st century are how the ice sheets uh, respond to both the warmer atmosphere and the warmer ocean. So in the 21st century, it's the dynamics of the ice sheets and the amount of uh, ice that's actually lost that's gonna be the biggest contributor to sea level rise um, uh, uh, during this century and by the end of the century. 
one of the most interesting things that I learned as part of this research is that it's not just the melting of the ice sheets that causes increased sea level, uh, uh, additional water from that melting that causes sea level rise, but these ice sheets are so massive, like the Antarctic ice sheet is so massive that it has its own gravitational field. And as the ice on the ice sheets melts, the mass, the gravitational field relaxes and that causes water levels to actually drop near the ice sheets and increase farther away. So because we're so far away from Antarctica, we could actually see 24% uh, more sea level rise in Boston on top of the global average because of what they're calling ice sheet fingerprint. So this is a really interesting um, area of research right now. And there's a lot of people working on really understanding the dynamics of the ice sheets so that we can understand how sea level rise is going to um, affect us in the future. So Mass DOT uh, was very concerned when they saw some of our maps. And so they came to us to help them understand the effects of sea level rise and extreme weather on their infrastructure. We started by looking at the central artery tunnel system, which we affectionately known as know as the Big Dig. And I'm sure anybody who's been in Boston uh, or been through Boston is familiar with uh, the Big Dig. It used to be an elevated highway, and now it's a tunnel under the city. Um, Mass DOT was particularly uh, worried about tunnel entrances, as you can imagine. You don't want seawater sea going down into the tunnel. And also vent buildings. So there are these vent buildings that actually uh, keep the air in the tunnel fresh. And they have louvers right at ground surface where if uh, there was flooding, it could cause uh, salt water to go inside these buildings. And these buildings go floors and floors down below the surface. So that's not a good thing. So uh, what Paul and I had done and what many people had done for, for flooding in the past was what we call a bathtub map. And uh, that was just taking a, a flat surface and slicing it through the terrain and anything above it was not flooded and everything, anything below it was, was flooded. And that's fine for screening. But if you really want to know the effects of a real storm, you have to build a model. And this shows if a nor'easter came in, uh, whereas before it's just all the same level of flooding, because you have winds and you have currents and you have waves, you get a, a very different uh, amount of flooding on the south coast, south of Boston, than you do on the north coast. So we built this, um, as part of this Mass DOT project, we built this big fancy hydrodynamic model that would, uh, that would predict, predict uh, flooding due to the major factors. Those major factors are hurricanes, which in the Boston, which in, in Boston Harbor are fairly infrequent and they're fast moving. So timing is everything when it comes to flooding from a hurricane. If, if the storm surge, which is the, the higher water level that comes along with these storms, if that happens to occur at high tide, then we get a lot of flooding. But if it happens, which is what happened in Boston, I mean, in New York City during uh, Superstorm Sandy, but if it happens to uh, occur at low tide, which is what happened in Boston during Superstorm Sandy, we don't see much of an impact. So hurricanes, infrequent, fast moving, timing is everything. Nor'easters are the things that really affect us more frequently. They're longer duration. And so you're likely to get the storm surge to occur at high tide and, and get more flooding. So the model took into account these two major um, coastal storm impacts on flooding. And long story short, you know, we spent a couple of years building this model and doing this vulnerability assessment and came up with these maps that show uh, risk of flooding uh, current day. And then as that risk of flooding uh, increases through time and the, the colors that you see are different levels of, of risk. So 1%, 10%, 50%. And we could zoom in and look at particular uh, assets that Mass DOT was interested in. So this is um, the Fort Point Channel area and uh, the uh, South Boston area and the North End area. So uh, Mass DOT could look very uh, easily at the, the, the detailed impacts on their assets. We could also look at the depths of flooding. So a map that looks very similar to what you've seen before, but instead of uh, risk or probability, you get depth. So here, this is current day, 2070. The, and as the colors change, that means the depth is changing. So you get a greater extent of flooding, but also deeper flooding. And this is by 20, uh, 2070, you have much more extensive flooding throughout the area. So we were able to provide uh, 
not only the maps, but, but the data at each node in the model so that MassDOT could really understand the impacts of uh, coastal flooding uh, from uh, potential sea level, from future sea level rise. So the outcomes for MassDOT, well, there were some good news. The extent of flooding under current conditions is fairly limited and at low probability. So they have time to prioritize the structures that are, that are vulnerable and what strategies they're gonna take. But the bad news is that some of those uh, structures that are vulnerable under current conditions um, are those tunnel portals that they worry about. And that num the number of uh, tunnel portals that are at risk actually triples by 2070. So it's a serious th threat that they have to be concerned about. So what they're doing with this information that we helped uh, provide to them is they're investing in short-term uh, flood mitigation strategies. They're developing strategies to prioritize and implement uh, their adaptation approaches over the short and long-term. They've expanded their assessment. And so, so now Paul and I are working with MassDOT to look at tra uh, infra transportation infrastructure along the entire Massachusetts coastline. And we're also, our, the approach that we developed for the central artery and for the coastline is, is being uh, is set as a standard now for Massachusetts in preparing for coastal flooding in the future. So that's uh, the end of mine. I'm gonna bring it back to Paul. Okay, so um, I'm gonna describe a exciting new initiative here at UMass Boston, uh, but I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, for a while, there've been several proposals to build a um, several lar a large harbor-wide barrier around Boston Harbor to protect it from uh, present increased coastal flooding. One idea was way out here. Another one was from Deer Island to uh, Wind Deer Island to Hull. Another one was just in the Inner Harbor. And so we did a study which we completed in, in um, May of 2018, which really showed this was not feasible for a range of economic, environmental, social, and environmental reasons. And the alternative that we recommended was what we really call you know, nature-based solutions or green infrastructure, essentially to elevate the coastline with parkland and, and other systems that, that are natural or mimic natural systems, that the elevation, this is actually in, in Charlestown near the Shrafts building, the elevation would actually protect against the flooding. But here we build a, uh, some rocky new tidal habitat. Here we have a wetland. So we would provide ecological co-benefits. Here you see people using the park. So not only would we, would we, would we be providing ecological benefits, uh, flood benefits, but also human benefits. And this solution is also a lot less expensive than building a massive offshore barrier. So the, um, and th these nature-based solutions can be quite effective. So this just shows an area of um, New York City uh, before Sandy. And this area here was behind a dune system. You can see after Sandy, this area is pretty much intact. Here's another area with no dune system. After Sandy, this area was pretty much flattened. So the fact that there was this nature, natural system here had huge impacts in managing the coastal flooding. So the, so the city has now um, uh, adopted this approach for the entire coastline of Boston to build it up with these nature-based solutions. The challenge is though, is there's a lot that's not known about how these systems um, really, uh, really function. There are no, there is real need for guidelines to support practitioners and stakeholders that are interested in this type of solution. There's actually a statement from the Army Corps of Engineers. So to address that challenge, uh, we, we, we've launched the Stone Living Lab funded by the Stone Foundation. This was launched in January of 2020. And the idea of the Stone Foundation Lab, the Stone Living Lab, is to really carry out the research to look at the effectiveness of these nature-based solutions to protect Boston Harbor from present and increased coastal flooding. And we're gonna be working initially on Rainsford Island and Pettix Island, but eventually throughout Boston Harbor, where we'll be carrying out um, actual experiments like this on the island. Like here's a possible flood management system, a layered flood system. We may have an offshore barrier around to break up wave energy and then some elevation here and so on. So we're actually be testing out these performance of these systems in a heavily monitored uh, environment. So I'll go back and point out this is a partnership 
of the School for the Environment, Boston Harbor Now, an NGO, the National Park Service, because the Boston Harbor Islands are part of a state and federal park system and city park system. And of course, the city is involved with this as well, and the state. So it's a very um, a comprehensive partnership. And I um, also want to point out, besides looking at the biophysical performance of nature-based systems, we're also going to be looking at what I call the social economic performance of these systems. For example, one of the challenges in Alan challenges is if you make an area too green, you attract a gen, you attract gentrification, you cause gentrification, and you drive out the very people you're trying to protect. So is it possible, let's say, to mix in affordable housing in a coastal flood protection system? So the people you're trying to protect can actually afford to live in the region you're protecting. And then um, uh, we're also doing, besides experiments and research, we're also planning to become a uh, international forum for this, this kind of research. We're gonna have large uh, community, many community science programs. Um, we're gonna of course be training uh, undergraduates and graduate students such as Lucy. And then we're gonna be providing policy and planning support to the region on this topic. And so we have our landing page here uh, stonelivinglab.org. And we invite you all to, uh, you know, learn, go to the landing page and learn more about the lab. So now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Lucy, who's going to be talking about what I call living, living, uh, uh, short, living uh, seawalls. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. So my work at UMass Boston, I'm a coastal ecologist, and I'm focused on uh, how can we innovate and improve in areas where we need hard coastal protection? Um, Dr. Kirshen talked about, ideally, we would like to have soft engineering um, in places and, and be able to have parks and berms and salt marsh and stuff. But there are obviously places where we need uh, stronger protection against waves and flooding, and particularly in the urban harbor area. So, that's my area of focus. Um, we all love having, being, a living along the coast. Uh, it's a wonderful place to live. It's why Boston kind of got built up here with the trade and transportation. But it is not always uh, a wonderful place to live because the ocean also brings us storms and flooding and erosion. And now, um, as Dr. Douglas talked about, we are faced with rising sea levels. So the response throughout the ages by humans has been to build walls, to, to try to protect ourselves against the waves, against the floating, pr flooding, protect against the erosion. And here in Massachusetts, we already have a considerable amount of engineered shoreline uh, throughout the state. In Boston Harbor, which is where my research is currently focused, about 60% of the harbor is some form of engineered hard substrate. So obviously seawalls, both the, the modern concrete ones and then the historic granite block seawalls, um, a lot of granite revetment around the shores and in the industrial and port areas, we see the steel and timber bulkheads. So I, my original focus was in rocky intertidal ecology and from a marine organism's point of view, I wondered, well, how different, if you're used to being on hard substrate, how different is it to be on natural rock, say out in Gloucester, versus on uh, a concrete seawall? And it turns out it actually is quite different. Um, the overall shape, the surface of what we do in human produced systems is very different than what nature does. So one of the key factors is this level of homogene homogeneity. So the orientation, we don't have a lot of difference between everything tends to be all vertical. We don't have a lot of different uh, orientations on our seawalls, the texture, the surface composition. And this extends both um, on different scales, both on the micro level, if you're down there looking at the differences right on the surface that a, that a little planktonic organism might settle on. And on the larger, you can see here the difference. We're, on the left, we have this seawall that's basically the same shape, 
the same texture for quite a long distance as compared to, this is a rock I was doing some research on and scraped off the barnacles. And you see underlying that even on just this one little area of rock, there's great diversity of the texture and the uh, surface composition. These seawalls also lack water retention features. So they typically don't have much in the way of crevices, of cracks, uh, pools to retain water. And there isn't much available to shelter organisms from sun, from heat in the summer, from predators or herbivores. If you're seaweed, you've got all sorts of snails that want to come along and munch at you and from getting hit or washed off by waves. So if you're an organism that has decided, I'm gonna make a go of it and try to live on a seawall, you tend to risk getting dried out, overheated, eaten, or washed away. It's not a great place to settle and raise a family. Well, why does this matter? Well, we have the loss of biodiversity and productivity on these seawalls. And when we have such an expanse of seawalls and engineered shorelines, it actually has implications for our coastal ecosystems. We see um, a shift to re uh, species that provide fewer ecosystem services, such as we have a lot of filter feeders that help us clean the water and improve water quality. We have nutrient cycling and all of these organisms, there's a, such a wide variety that live in this intertidal area from the highest tides down to the, the shallow subtidal that actually provide habitat and depend on this area for habitat and food. Um, and these include our, our birds, for any of you who are bird watchers certainly know this, um, and fish, including our shellfish, and ultimately for us humans, both in terms of, of eating the fish and shellfish and recreation. So what can we do? Well, this is an area of research worldwide. And one of the things that is being considered is can we start changing the actual building blocks that we're using? Um, this is from Arc Marine out of Plymouth, England. Can we create tide pools um, on these shores? So. Um, over here on the right, you see what Econcrete actually did in a project in New York City. Um, so creating human-made tide pools when we don't have natural ones. And this is my area of research, which is looking at, could we design, make changes to the seawalls themselves in terms of the texture and the surface features so that it makes it a more biofriendly place. And these are showing tiles from, again, this is worldwide interest. Um, and people have been kind of throwing a lot of different designs out there, trying to figure out what works. Um, here's some from Hong Kong, um, some very beautiful, attractive ones coming out of Sydney, Australia. The research that I'm doing is part of the Stone Living Lab. Um, this is a, a early prototype that I'm showing you. Um, it's not as, uh, as, as attractive as maybe the ones out of Sydney, but it's very oriented towards the science and engineering side of understanding what, if we're doing a crevice, how deep, how wide is, is kind of the optimal uh, dimensions. And we're going to be instrumenting these to be taking the temperature within the crevices to understand what the humidity levels are, the moisture within them. Uh, we're going to be trying a, a variety of different crevice um, orient, you know, having some slanted ones, uh, deeper ones, wider ones. And we're specifically targeting species of seaweed that provide important resources for other organisms. So we don't want just anybody growing here. We don't want noxious seaweeds or, or invasives. We're looking to support our native seaweeds um, that, that provide habitat to, for other organisms. Likewise, for intertidal animals, there are plenty of invasive species that might want to grow here, but we're going to be focusing on providing conditions to support our native species. And ultimately, 
This will also give us a lot of opportunities in this project to engage with the public. It's gonna be part of our education work. And I'm also hoping eventually to have some demonstration sites so that people can come and see some of the different designs and sort of see how things are going as it were. I'm gonna leave you with a picture from King's Beach in Lynn that was taken in 1911. And the text down at the bottom notes the seawall erosion. And this is Kings Beach in Lynn in 2018. And here I am noting the seawall erosion. And you'll notice not a lot has changed. We are still building our seawalls in the same way. We still don't have a rich marine ecosystem on them. And the exciting thing is that UMass and the Stone Living Lab is really thinking outside the box and looking at how can we do better um, as we go forward and create robust, productive, biodiverse uh, marine ecosystems on these walls. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to fellow alum, Carl Spector. Thank you, thank you, Lucy. Um, it's, it's, it's great to be here. I hadn't seen your most recent work. I love all those tiles. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, your, your results because we can start getting that kind of variety in Boston, it would be great. Um, and it, it's great to speak with you all today. So, you know, Paul and Ellen and Lucy have laid out all the themes that we are trying to apply in Boston and our work on climate adaptation. The city of Boston put out its first climate action plan in 2007. And in 2019, we issued uh, the third update to that original plan. And in each plan, it's gotten more ambitious, it's gotten more detailed, it's gotten more concrete, uh, not only because we understand better and better the necessity of moving forward aggressively, but because due to the work of people like Paul and Ellen and Lucy and many others, both here in Boston and around the world, we understand the opportunities, the technologies, the policies that make these things happen. Paul indicated a very important theme of the work that we have to do in Boston in taking climate action, both in terms of climate adaptation, preparing for the effects of climate change and in carbon reduction, reducing the cause of climate change. And that is the integration of our climate policies with all the other policies and all the other goals that the city has. How do we uh, integrate it with economic development? How do we integrate it with concerns around equity? How do we use opportunities to do something uh, on the coast to open up access to the coast, not just to the people living nearby, but to all the people in Boston? And how do we address other uh, concerns of climate change, particularly around heat? in a way that enhances the environment, enhances the livability of our cities, and again, is, is sensitive to equity needs, to economic development, to recreation, to, um, to health, and all the other goals that the city has. And thanks to the work of, of Paul and Ellen and Lucy and, and many other people, both at UMass Boston and around the city, we're finding more and more ways to do that. You know, in, I wanna talk about briefly about both of the sides of our work around climate, that is in terms of carbon reduction and in climate adaptation. Uh, I'll start, let me start with climate adaptation. So that's pro primarily what we've been focusing on uh, in the past few minutes. Uh, the city is addressing you know, three major components of that now. We're thinking about how do we deal with um, more intense precipitation. Um, and uh, you saw a slide about how that's increasing. How do we deal with increased heat? And how do we deal with sea level rise and coastal flooding? Uh, the city has just launched um, a uh, probably about a year long planning study to develop more ways of addressing heat in the city. Uh, that we are doing a, a direct study of measures around heat also coupling that with a, a, a citywide plan for our tree canopy, because we know that the presence of trees does so much to uh, can reduce heat in the city, but how do we use other sorts of green infrastructure? 
how do we couple that with the design of streets and of our buildings and of our open spaces? What sort of social and public health measures do we have to put in place? For example, the city has a network of cooling centers um, to deal with the acute uh, occurrences of high heat in Boston. How do we make sure that uh, we have them in the right places, that they're accessible, that they are resilient so that they can continue to operate if there should be a, a, power, a power outage. Uh, and then on the level of sea level rise, uh, where we've had obviously a major, major focus the past five years. Uh, we did a citywide plan in 2016 called Climate Ready Boston. And that's a high level plan, uh, which addressed all the effects of climate change. And one of the major recommendations that came out of the plan, or one of the major uh, measures of, of that plan was to do more detailed planning in all our coastal neighborhoods. And that's what we've been doing. We put out four neighborhood plans so far for uh, East Boston and Charlestown, and Paul showed you uh, some of the, uh, you know, some of the, the drawings, the plans that came out of that. Uh, we've uh, did South Boston, downtown, and Dorchester, and we're planning around 40 inches of sea level rise, which is a, a plausible number to plan for. Looking at about 50 years uh, uh, and around 2070, if you remember the chart that Paul showed about the projections of sea level rise for the rest of the century. And these detailed plans look at both public and private spaces. Uh, they're looking at a variety of, of measures and that has to be responsive to the existing landforms there and the structures of ownership too. They're, they're private lands so that when the city, for example, uh, renovates a park, we are making uh, that coastal park uh, part of the flood uh, resilience uh, program that we have in Boston. Uh, we are just finishing up parks in the North End called the Langonum Popolo Park. The original plan was just a basic reservation of that very nice park and the fields and, and uh, play, uh, playground areas there. But uh, because we were working on our climate adaptation plan, we modified those plans to elevate them so that as neighboring parcels are redeveloped or built up or uh, redesigned, they become part of a, as I said, a flood resilience network. We have just started the last coastal plan in this round of, of planning. We are uh, going back to East Boston, Charlestown, because in the very first neighborhood plan that we did there, we just did a restricted a part of those two neighborhoods because we that was our first neighborhood plan and we wanted to uh, make sure that we knew what we were doing. And uh, we are going back to East Boston and Charlestown to complete the plans for those two neighborhoods. And then we will have a complete set of, of medium detail plans uh, for the whole coastal stretch of Boston. Obviously, there's still more planning to do. There's more detail and, and more engineering and design choices that will need to be made, but we will have a complete set of plans and, and about 30 years of projects, which we are currently working now to develop a more detailed uh, implementation schedule with priorities and uh, putting in place the mechanisms for carrying out that work, of course, which we've already started. The other side of this, of course, is carbon reduction. As we are preparing for the effects of climate change, we have to make sure that we are reducing uh, the uh, effects of climate change in the future. As Paul showed again in one of his slides, there's a lot of range uh, in some of the projections and a major, major component of that range of that uncertainty, if you will, is not around the basic science that goes into it, but, uh, uh, but predicting how we as a global human community will do in reducing our carbon emissions so that we are reducing the future effects of climate change. The city of Boston has a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, we are working very hard to 
use the powers that we, the city have uh, to make those change happen. Not everything is under city's control. For example, transportation has to be addressed on the regional on a regional basis, working very closely with our uh, neighboring municipalities and our colleagues at the state to think about what's happening in the regional transportation system. Uh, we are working to increase our purchases of, of renewable energy. Some of that is under the city of Boston's control, especially with our new uh, municipal aggregation program called a community trace electricity, whereby we're raising the uh, proportion of renewable energy in the electricity that most people in the city of Boston buy. Uh, buy. And then uh, the area that right now has our highest focus is developing programs to reduce emissions from, uh, from buildings by uh, encouraging greater efficiency and of course the greater use of renewable fuels. The city right now is developing what's called a building performance standard, uh, which will set uh, carbon uh, emissions uh, standards for all kinds of buildings for the next 30 years. Uh, we've been holding a lot of public uh, open houses and consultations about that. It's a major component of the last uh, climate action plan that we released in 2019. And we're very hopeful that it will lead to significant uh, reductions in carbon emissions uh, for the city. Thank you. Steve, I see you're back on, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Carl. At this time, we'd like to move into our Q&A session. Um, so thank you to our audience members for submitting questions. Um, we will do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, but of course, if, if we don't, we can always follow up with an email uh, for an answer on, on any questions that you may have. Um, we'll start with this question, and this question is for Ellen. Ellen, uh, what is the expected impact of sea level rise by 2050 on the UMass Boston campus, and how can we mitigate those impacts? Well, um, interestingly, uh, we as as faculty at UMass Boston and, and our favorite people, our students are at UMass Boston. That's actually been a focus of of our study right from the start. And uh, the analysis that we've done on, of the campus itself, it's high enough that it's it's really not highly affected directly by flooding, even under worst case scenarios. Although we haven't been on campus for almost a year now and there have been a lot of changes. So we may have to redo some of that analysis. But the good news is the campus itself um, seems to be uh, high enough that it, that the, it won't be that impacted by, uh, at least in the, you know, in the next uh, uh, few couple of decades by uh, sea level rise and flooding. But the thing that will be affected is number one, access to the campus. So the, everybody who drives along Morrissey Boulevard now knows that it floods basically, you know, just uh, to think about a rain event or something, it, it floods. So the, the access to the campus is very impacted. And I know that um, DCR and MassDOT and uh, the city are, have been looking at that issue for quite a while. And the surrounding areas adjacent to the uh, campus like Harbor Point, those areas are also affected. So they have to be a part of this um, uh, shore-based uh, protective approaches that uh, Carl and Paul talked about. Great, hey, thank you. Uh, Paul, this question is for you. Uh, what are we doing in our communities to slow or avert global warming? And what real measures are we taking to adapt our communities to pending changes in climate? Um, you know, I don't know what every single community is doing in the area, but um, I know what they should be doing. <laughs> and, and the first thing they should be doing is, is controlling the emission of greenhouse gases, you know, switching to renewables, switching to electric vehicles and so on. Because as we, as we all know, if we lower our emissions of greenhouse gases, we have a lot less severe climate change impacts. The other thing communities should be doing is, is land use planning. You know, you don't want to put new construction 
in, in areas that are going to flood now or in the future. Or if you do have to put them in these areas, you make them you know, flood proof. You make sure they're resilient to the climate changes. Also, they're built to standards that have high insulation, so they don't just ignore their energy costs. And then um, the other thing you want to do, obviously, is you want to support political leaders who are aware of the threats of climate change. You know, how we vote is really important topic. And the other thing is the community should take, uh, take advantage of the Municipal Vulnerability Program, the MVP program of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which provides funds for communities to actually um, deal with their vulnerabilities to climate change. So, you know, communities should be doing all, all of those things, or at least some of them, to deal with this uh, major, major threat. Thank you, Paul. This next question is for Ellen. Ellen, what is the expected impact of sea level rise along the Massachusetts coast? So more in particular, the greater Boston area versus the campus itself. Yeah, so uh, that's been the subject of uh, a lot of our research over the last decade or so. And uh, as far as <clears throat> the sea level rise, uh, as far as how much sea level rise we expect to see, as I think Paul mentioned um, earlier, by 2030, by mid-century 2030, 2050, we're expecting to see one to two feet of sea level rise. By 2070, more like four feet. And by the end of the century, it could be seven to eight feet um, of sea level rise. And so depending on the um, geometry and the terrain that your community has the geography. Uh, it, if it's very low lying, then you can imagine it would be very, you would be much more exposed to uh, sea level rise and coastal storms than if it, than it was high, high level terrain, or if you have a lot of natural uh, barriers like uh, beaches and dunes and, and salt marshes, you'll be more protected. So a lot of that has to do with the, uh, the terrain and the, the geometry of your community. Um, and uh, the MassDOT study that uh, we're cu currently doing has data that's going to be released available to all communities to, to try to help with that issue. Thank you, Ellen. Carl, this next question is for you. With your UMass Boston education and work experience, what are some of the most important skills and concepts for the next generation of environmental policy makers to master? And what are the best ways to achieve this mastery? Okay, I, I suppose I I, sh, I suppose I'm supposed to give a plug for the uh, School of the Environment at, at UMass Boston at this point. But it was it was a great uh, experience for me, and and when I was there, my research was on a relative species abundance in benthic polychaetes. So uh, that that would, turned out to be a great path for me. And uh, but. Not, no kidding, uh, kidding aside, uh, you know, that as we've been talking about, you know, working on climate change policy and issues and science is, is an amazingly wide field, you know, that it involves uh, basic science to understand what's happening, uh, both in terms of, you know, the, the climate, the, um, what's happening in terms of its biological effects, the sort of things that Lucy has been looking at. But it also is, how do we use our laws? How do we use uh, our land use planning? How do we design our buildings? Uh, how do we make our buildings more efficient? So, you know, it's science, it's engineering, it's law, it's planning, it's design, uh, it's it's communication, you know, commu uh, you know as, uh, Fortunately, we do not have uh, much of an issue in, in the Boston area of people who are denying climate change, but we know it's been a very difficult message to get across in other parts of the country. How do we communicate to people? And how do we educate the people? So there's, I do get this question a lot, uh, sometimes when I speak to college or graduate uh, students, and there's really no one answer. There's there because there are so many factors that need to be I left out economics, very important. Um, in 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 the environment department at City of Boston, I've got uh, I've got people who come from the hard sciences, you know, from physics and biology, 
you know, who uh, I've got, uh, we have lawyers, we have people who have gone to, uh, you know, planning or architecture schools, we have people who have um, gone to business school, uh, you know, working on climate change issues. So to anyone who's interested in working at it, think about what your particular strength is, what you are particularly in, what aspect of it you are particularly interested in working. Find the connection to climate change and it will open up immediately into other areas. And it, by your pursuit of, of, your, uh, of, of knowledge and of your desire to contribute to our societies and our communities work on this, the other things that you need to know uh, will become apparent. Pursue them with avidity and just be prepared. It's all interesting. And it's, it's, there's an immense amount of information and subtlety and interactions that we need to explore, but you can come at it from any direction that is most comfortable for you. Thank you, Carl. So we're gonna move on to a few of the, the questions that have come in live uh, during the Q&A session here. And one in particular I think is interesting and, and this might be for Lucy. Lucy, an uh, attendee would like to know, uh, won't having organi organisms on the seawall or any structure being used to keep the habitats for people safe from flooding make these structures break down? That's a, that's a great question and it's an interesting one and kind of following on to what uh, Carl just said, I may be a coastal ecologist, but I'm learning rapidly engineering and all about concrete chemistry and particularly concrete in salt water and learning about things like ion penetration of concrete and because anything that we design, if I, as you know, from an ecological point of view, say to the city of Boston, or I noticed we had somebody here asking about, you know, is this relevant? Will, will places like Hingham benefit from this? If I come up with wonderful things that make all the seaweed happy, and yet I say to the town, oh, but really sorry, rather than this lasting for 20, 30, 50 years, you're probably going to get about five years out of it. Nobody's going to want to put that in. So one of the interesting things about solving this problem is it combines the engineering, it combines the economics, it combines the biology, and it's got to work on all of those counts. Now to this point on the, the organisms on the seawall, it turns out that organisms like barnacles can actually retard the breakdown of concrete and there's there's good studies on this um and so this becomes an interesting thing where actually these organisms i mean it's a, it's a the scientist in me says it's both you have increased drag so that, that you're having a lot of stuff there when the water comes by you've now got increased resistance but at the same time a lot of these algae we have what we call crustose algae and barnacles can actually prevent uh, the, slow the concrete breakdown at the same time. So this to me is the challenge, the wonderful um, challenge of this as, as, you know, as research is finding those sweet spots and balancing all this out and learning what's going to work here under our conditions in the Boston area. Thank you, Lucy. This next question is really interesting and um, I, anyone feel free to to step up and, and take it. Uh, what do you think the likelihood is that the work you are suggesting actually gets done in time to avert disaster? And they make to the, uh, the unfortunate circumstances down in Texas. Well, let, let me start, of course, that, that's a key question. Um, and we and and it's it's there are again two aspects for it. It's it's how quickly can we implement our plans around climate adaptation? That's again whether in terms of you know a coastal flooding protection or for mitigating heat inside uh, away from the coast, and and how does that intersect with our reduction of of uh, our carbon emissions globally? 
uh, it, you know, it depends on us. It depends on us as as a community. Uh, th that you know, here in Boston, uh, there is an, uh, an enormously supportive community. You know that uh, you know uh, both uh, current mayor uh, Mayor Walsh, even though he's he's going to be leaving soon. Mayor Walsh has been enormously supportive of this work and taken a lot of leadership. And the previous mayor, Mayor Menino, did. I expect a content continuation of these kinds of policies um, as the political leadership changes in Boston. And we've had enormous support from the community, uh, whether it's you know the universities, the business community, and our residents. So a lot of work is getting done. And we have on uh, you know a, a supportive state environment. And, and now we ha even have a, a um, we're going to have a, we have a, a support of federal and government too. So it gives us enormous amount of opportunity, and we've made a lot of progress. Of course, that we see what we have to do. Um, but every day, you know, there's more steps being taken. We see more possibilities. We see more uh, advantages, uh, not just in terms of climate, but in terms of economy and public health and you know equity that can come that not just can come, but are coming out of this work. So I'm optimistic, but we have to stay diligent. We have to stay at it. Thank you, Carl. The next question um, probably is for Carl too, and it might, you actually may have, have made reference to uh, some, something in your last answer. Um, how closely do you work with Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on climate change? Um, directly not much, uh, that, uh, you know, that the regulation of the electricity grid and, uh, pipeline networks, it's mostly done at the federal and state level. So, um, you know, we will, so we don't interact much with the, with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, we, we may occasionally uh, submit some, you know, comment. We work more closely with our colleagues at the state about how, uh, you know, the state is regulating uh, the energy networks. And we have inter also interaction, though it's, again, it's mostly through the state with what's is called ISO New England, the independent system operator for New England, which regulates the electricity grid uh, for the uh, all of New England, and of course, we understand the uh, import, especially understand the importance of of the grid operators from what's happened in Texas over the, in the past week. Thank you, Carl. So this has been a really interesting discussion, and I want to sincerely thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to participate today, and a special thank you to all of our viewers. We hope that you found this presentation informative and interesting, and thank you for tuning in. Our next Beacon Discussion Series event will take place on Thursday, March 25th at 12 p.m. again, and this discussion will focus on politics. Members of our political science department and political science alumni will explore the idea, or the integrity rather, of democracy. Mm -hmm. Hope that you will join us again for another dynamic discussion. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Stay well and go Beacons.